my lovely Betwixters, it's me, Kate Lister. I am here with your fair dues warning. Kate, what is a fair dues warning? Well, it's the warning that we give at the top of each show to let you know that this is an adult podcast spoken by adults to other adults about adulty things and you need to be an adult too. So, if you continue listening to this adult podcast and you get offended, upset, traumatised, triggered, etc., then you'll just have to say to yourself, well, fair dues, she did tell us. Your emotions can be your own greatest enemy. Or under control, your emotions can make you healthier and happier and improve the lives of people around you. Happiness, sadness, anger, surprise, disgust, fear, lust. We all know what these emotions feel like, right? Right. I know happiness might be a bit thin on the ground right now, but, but generally we've got an idea. Or do we? What if I told you that there's no such thing as emotions? Does that make you feel cross? Which is actually an emotion, which then I'd tell you might not actually be a thing. Oh, it's very confusing. <laughs> what am I? Confusion! Is that an emotion? Mm, is that just a state? I don't know. But what if I told you that emotion, the thing that, that makes you laugh and cry and cry, laugh or cringe, is just a construction? Hmm. It is confusing, isn't it? But are you ready to have everything that you think you know challenged? Well, today, betwixt the sheets, we are going to get introspective. What do you look for in a man? Oh, money, of course. <laughs> You're supposed to rise when an adult speaks to you. I make perfect copies of whatever my boss needs by just turning a knob and pushing the button. <laughs> Yes, social courtesy does make a difference. Goodness, what beautiful time. Goodness has nothing to do with it, Jerry. Hello and welcome back to Betwixt the Sheets, the history of sex scandal in society with me, Kate Lister. What is emotion? Do we all feel the same things as each other? Is what I think of as love what you think of? as love. When I feel happy, do you feel like that as well? Do we feel the same things as people who lived a hundred, five hundred, a thousand years ago feel? Did happy mean the same thing to the Romans that it means to us today? These are perplexing questions indeed. And today I am joined by Richard Firth Godby here to find out about the origins and the history of emotions and what they have to do with witchcraft and the history of desire. Hello and welcome to Betwixt the Sheets. Richard Firth, God be here. How are you? I'm really good. Yeah, glad to be here. How are you? I'm so excited to talk to you about what we're going to talk about today because it's confused me already. <laughs> and I like being confused because people can explain things to me. You are an expert in research around disgust, which is a fascinating emotion. And yeah. we're going to talk about that one in a minute. But the history of emotions, and I think what completely blindsided me reading about your work, was this idea that people haven't always experienced emotions the way that we think we do today. That We think that that's a constant, right? That people have always experienced emotions as they do now? Yeah. And then you come along and go, nope. Yeah, some people assume uh, that emotions are always unchanging, they're always mm. the same. One level that may be correct at the base feeling level, the thing we feel, but how we understand that feeling, what we do with it, how it matters, how we describe it, all of that has this huge cultural weight on it. And of course, if it's got a cultural weight, then it changes through history as well. It's not as obvious as it seems. It's like, oh, my head. <laughs> Because like, we think of emotions as being, it's a really primitive part of ourselves. And emotions are often things that you can't articulate. Yeah. They, and there are real base level ones like fear and desire and all those things. You yeah. would argue that those things are not constant. They're not necessarily constant. No, there's a big debate amongst researchers right now. There's always a debate amongst researchers in psychology and things, but particularly in emotions. And one is so, there's a bunch of people who think these core feelings, mm. these things we feel, that are sometimes called core affect, sometimes called emotion, depends which paper you're reading, to be quite honest, they are 
unchanging and you can actually map them onto certain pathways so that's the fear pathway the famous amygdala mm. causes uh, flight and fight responses and there's other pathways there's the anger pathway there's something called the amygdala hypothalamus pariaquitic call i think that's the word gray which is all to do with anger and the, yeah everyday fatigue and <laughs> these things can apparently always that's how it happens your brain has these pathways and then you're angry or you're frightened and that's yeah. it but there's another group that say well no actually because there may be but firstly that word fear well that's an english word if you look in other languages the word they use might not be quite how we understand fear it might be something okay. else disgust is a classic one in that ekel a german word which these days in german means disgust just like it does in english sort of nauseated and feeling yucky about 150 years ago ekel meant that feeling you get when someone's tickling oh. you that moving away, that, oh, good, get off me. So it's a more unpleasant thing that makes you want to get away okay. from it. And it's things that you want to avoid, then they're yuck, they're nauseating. Thing. So these words don't exactly map. They don't perfectly map. So who are we to say that's the fear pathway? Just because psychology is mostly English, we get to okay. use our English word. When actually these people come over and say, well, is that fear? Is it this other thing? We don't understand it. And then there's this whole cultural layer on top. When you're frightened, what you're supposed yeah. to do. Are you supposed to scream and shout with your arms raised in the air? Are you supposed to keep it all in and pretend you're not frightened? And different parts of the world of emotion science, let's say, look at different bits of this whole bundle of stuff. And they all think their bit's the important <laughs> bit and everything else is rubbish. So they're always rowing at each other. No, the cultural bit matters. No, no, it's the bit in the brain. No, no. And so, yeah, I'm sitting in the middle. You're all saying the same mm. thing. Just talk to each other. You know? I think that's fascinating is that the idea that we think that we feel something, but then because we give a name to it, we think that that's a constant and immediate, but it might not be. I mean, there are lots of different types yeah. of what we call fear. There's anxiety and there's... There's disgust and there's nervousness mm. and there's sheer terror and all of these things, they change. Yeah. And fl I'm, honestly, I'm confusing myself now. Is confusion <laughs> an emotion? It can be, yeah. Again, I'm depends who you talk quite to. A lot. Let's <laughs> talk about the one that you're a specialist in, uh, disgust. All right. Because this okay. is one that absolutely fascinates me. Because disgust is often, yeah. again, depending on who you talk to, it's one of the really primal reactions that we have. Mm. And it's something that we need <laughs> and it needs to override a lot of other emotions. So if yeah. you're really hungry and something is rotten, yeah. you need the disgust reflex to go, fuck it out. I don't want it. It's bad for me. And it can actually be yeah. utilized in other ways. Yeah. I read an article that Donald Trump was elected in part because he triggered the disgust reflex in his fan base. Not him personally. Yeah. Well, disgust at its most basic is thought of as what's known as a pathogen avoidance mechanism in that we evolved to, if something's got something that's going to kill mm. us, bacteria or a worm in it, we've evolved that the look and the smell and the taste of that thing makes us want to avoid it. Go, oh, no, yeah. no. That's obvious because if that hadn't happened, we'd have all eaten rotten fruit and died a long time ago and there'd be no human race. So that's a really good evolutionary thing. So this is an example of what I'm talking about. That's the basic thing, really simple. In the brain, it's no one's quite sure, but it's got something to do with a part called the insula in the middle, which seems to regulate things. And the interesting thing is those bits of the brain that are triggered when you are, say, given a picture of a Scandinavian delicacy, let's say, and you see it and you go, they eat that? Yeah. I've eaten all of it. Don't ask me. It's, it's, oh, some of it's actually surprisingly nice once you get fish? past your nose and into the mouth and go, oh, yeah, yeah, you've got to get past the nose and in the mouth. And then it's in the mouth, you go, past the disgust well, reflex. that's actually really nice. Yes. I've come to the conclusion if, if a culture says something's a delicacy, that means it's probably horrible to everybody else. But Almost certainly. Anyway, the same parts of the brain light up seem to light up when someone does a morally disgusting act as well wow. as a physically disgusting one. And there have been studies by a guy called Jonathan Haidt, whose surname I always pronounce wrong. Sorry, Jonathan. He's done studies to show that people who are more prone to physical disgust tend to be more politically extreme. Originally mm -hmm. found that they were generally right wing, that if you found everything had to be tidy and you didn't like yuck and so on, you tended to be more extreme because there's kind of a purity element of it. So anyone's not mm -hmm. got the same politics as you, you push them away. And think In disgust. You're like a social contamination. In disgust, yeah. And Donald Trump is an example of tapping into that. Mm. He's not the first, 
by any measure. And it's discussed as used as a mechanism for othering people throughout history. The Nazis are particularly famous for it. They did this awful thing where they'd show films likening uh, Jewish people and others to rats and things to try and other them and make them a disgusting thing to make what they did supposedly easy on the population. It's been used a long time. It was the in the Rwanda Civil War, the people were described as cockroaches. This kind of using disgust to alienate a people a group of people so that you can do bad things to them sadly goes back a long way and it seems to be really effective as well yes very effective because it's a very old part of makeup there are some people who just look into disgust a bit more extreme than me and they say the very first early microorganisms in order to know what to that started eating other microorganisms in order to know what to eat must have had something that's like proto-taste. Mm. And then the organisms that made themselves taste horrible means there must have been some kind of proto-disgust. I mean, I don't know if it goes back that far, but certainly insects have a sort of disgust mechanism. Cockroaches apparently think we're revolting. That's why they run away. So God, it's that's kind so of, weird. You know, we had no idea the feeling was mutual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, we should get together around the coffee us and the cockroaches and hammer out our differences, I think. We're just taken over by disgust and this othering mechanism. Just misunderstood. Yeah, misunderstood. They want food, we want food. Come, we'll share. <laughs> if you can trigger the disgust mechanism in a group of people, and the disgust mechanism is as powerful as wanting to get away from rotten food and yep. something diseased and something that will, that same very primitive rotten milk type of thing, and you can trigger that reflex in somebody, but you can attribute it to something else. Yeah. What you're doing is you're firing up that exact same reaction, but like linking it to a group of people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's happened all throughout history. Wow. Uh, one particularly bad example is witches. This is something I actually researched a long time ago, but there's a, mm. an old passion called abomination. Abomination is this, it's disgust, but it's a disgust of things that are sinful. And if you read the Latin version of the Bible, every single sin right. is an abomination to God. In other words, it makes God, sins make God disgusted with you. And you've got to do an offering to get him back in your God graces. Right. Yeah. Yes. There used to be in the Hebrew Bible, there were about six or seven different words for this abomination. But Jerome went, oh, I can't be bothered with that. Here, I'll use one. And just used abominatio all the way through the Bible. So we got this <laughs> one emotion for all of them, which is another example of how emotions change over time. Some One language takes another language and simplifies it or mm -hmm. complicates it or whatever. But when the witchcraft started, when you ever see abomination in texts in sort of the 16th, 17th century, it's always near God or sin or idolatry or another word like that. It's always in a sentence about religion or it's in a sentence about witches wow. quite often. And so the way witches were portrayed were as these abominable creatures, these sinful creatures, these things that went against God. Women being judged on how they look goes back a long, long way. So if you looked wrong, in other words, you were too mm. old or whatever, or you acted wrong, then you might be uh, considered an abomination or causing abomination. And so you'd be on the list of possible witches. And so that's how it was used then in particular. And we're in a climate of fear in the 17th century. Everyone thinks the world's going to end because mm. America's discovered and the printing press has told everyone about it and there's disease and famine and everyone's at war and all that kind of stuff. So that yeah. didn't help. But yeah, it can be very, very yeah. powerful disgust. Very powerful. Is there any way of overriding it? I mean, you said there that yeah. eating Swedish delicacy, that seems to be a perfect example of it because the rotting fish, that triggers all of your disgust reflexes reflexes even yeah. if thinking about it yeah. probably have people going oh can't do it can't do it that's the disgust reflex can you override it oh yeah desensitization is given a bad press we always think about people playing computer games and going out and really which doesn't happen if it wasn't for desensitization no nurse could do their job no doctor could do their job no fishmonger i guess could do their oh, job yeah. you know and so you, you can be desensitized to it and a lot of therapy for people who have phobias because a lot of phobias are more disgust based than fear based like arachnophobia and so on will look at mm. desensitizing you to the thing that is making you feel that reaction and so it's a case of desensitizing you can get over it or you can which sometimes means pushing yourself over something like holding your nose and eating the fish or trying the kazumazu cheese with live maggots in it or something like that you know <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> a third of the world eats insects every day they so. do 
I mean, that's a perfect example of the disgust yeah. reflex in, our, in action is what animals we feel okay eating and yeah. what animals we don't feel okay yeah. eating. And there's nothing in it other mm. than like a gut reaction to it, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've eaten insects quite a lot. I, sometimes when I do talks, I will shock people by eating mealworms. And I look at the half of the audience that go, oh, can I try one? The other half that recoil. And it's quite an interesting thing to see. I quite like quite them. Quite a bit crunchy. <laughs> good protein would you argue that disgust is is that part of anger is it an anger reflex what is that it's kind of different there's a similarity in that that disgust can be what's called a social emotion in other words an emotion that is targeted at someone or something Mm. but it can also be a very personal thing you can see something just keep it to yourself whereas anger is always there is something anger's caused by either somebody stopping you getting what you want or somebody harming you in some way. It's always got this target. And so sort of they both have this target thing, but not always. But anger is primarily and purely a social emotion. You don't get angry at nothing. What do you mean that it's a social emotion? A social emotion is emotion where a lot of emotions, happiness, sadness, that kind of internal, the you emo- what you feel and I feel this way because I feel like this. Whereas anger is always directed at something or someone. Okay. It has an impact on society. You are going to react in some way to that person. And disgust is a social emotion, but not always. Anger is always social. Shame is another social emotion. You feel shame because of how people around you are going to react if they find out something about you. It's not something you can just necessarily internalise. If you could just internalise it, you wouldn't care. You're worried about society. So there are quite a few emotions known as the social emotions that do that kind of thing. Shame and embarrassment seem to be incredibly powerful emotions when it comes to us as a social species in that that people have yeah. ended their lives or would rather die than experience a feeling of shame. Like you said about the witch trials there. I mean, in Salem, for example, people were given the option of yeah. if you confess, then we'll let you live. And there were people that would rather say, no, fuck off, I'd rather yeah. die. So shame is really powerful too. Yeah, there are people who'd rather not have the shame. The thing about shame is it was powerful enough that it would affect how you might die because it would affect your honour. So if you did a shameful crime and you were poor, you might get hung by this earthly rope stuff. But if you did a massive crime like treason but happened to be a queen, (laughs) mentioning no names, Anne Boleyn, you'd get a fine French swordsman to take your head in one stroke with the finest steel. So the honour-shame thing was and is very powerful. Parts of the world like Japan, shame is a huge driver in their society it's kind of the emotional regime of china which is how you're supposed to act and the emotions that power your culture is quite powerfully shame based it's based on if i'm the first one to leave the office then i feel shame and i so i can't be i've got to be the last one to leave the office and this whole shame engine that drives japanese and some chinese cultures what's the purpose of shame from an anthropological point of view, it can't be just so we won't leave the office no. early. As like a species, what is the point of, oh, I feel really bad about myself? Oh, it's terrible. Shame, mm. generally, I mean, we're a group animal, aren't we? We're, we're a herd. Humans herd. And it's one of the social emotions seem to keep the herd together. So, you know, anger is at somebody in the herd doing wrong or someone outside our herd wanting to take something from us, from which we get things known as enemy ship and war. We get this othering of they're different to us so they can make us angry if they behave differently disgust again disgust as well disgust is social elements are very much about keeping you see somebody acting the whole pathogen avoidance idea is that if somebody is behaving incorrectly within your culture a criminal act in the same way you feel disgust to them because they are a social pathogen who might infect the rest of culture if you don't so these that's what the social emotions do they keep a herd together and shame again it's i have done something if i do that and i'll feel this feeling which means the the herd will say you've done wrong and i'll be the object of their disgust i'll be the person who they are upset with so i don't want to do that i'm gonna not have the shame yeah wow all right so i'm gonna break a few hearts now because i think we have to talk about the big one the love as as an emotion oh, yeah. because you could look at human history and say love's always been here that intense impassion and desire what's your take on that what's love all about 
<laughs> What's love got to do with it? <laughs> yeah, love is an interesting one. In some ways, it has kind of always been around. It's thought of very differently at different times. Sometimes it's a mechanical process where you, that person and that person will be put together and it will grow because it must, because she's rich and we want some of her money for the family mm -hmm. or we want the political union. One of the main emotions back in the days of the Greek thought, Plato, was love. There was love and hate was the sort of the two primary emotions, uh, again, social emotions that held things together. But the love was more an attraction towards something, a pull towards something. So Aristotle speaks of the reason we are attached to the earth and don't fly off into space is because of love pulling us towards the center of the earth. And it's that kind of attraction, that pulling, if you like. But then you get to the early Christians who split love in two. So you've got self-love, which is being rich, loving, being powerful, loving, being whatever, you know, the, the kind of love that drives capitalism, that kind of love. Mm. And then you've got the the true love, the correct love, the love of the finis, the love of God, the love of not sinning, the love of finally getting to heaven, which is supposed to drive everything. This is the one that's caused trouble for certain reasons. And the main reason it might, when I talk about it is the Crusades, because one of the great classic papers about the Crusades is called Crusading as an Act of Love by John Riley Smith. It's absolutely fantastic. And in it, he points out that when Pope Urban started talking about the Crusades and made his great speech at Chartres, he uh, used the word caritas, which is a form of love, a charity love, quite a lot to say this is the Holy Land. Our fellow Christians who we love are being harmed. Our holy land is being harmed. We love this place. We love it so much. So we must go and murder a lot of people to get it back because of our love for it. And there are even accounts from the other side, from the uh, Islamic side that say, these guys really love this place. I mean, it's all right, isn't it? But they love it. It's weird how much they love it. So it's sort of, you know, it can have a dark side, can love. Again, like in evolutionary biological terms, just as us as a species, what function does it play? Because yeah. when you kind of look at it, it is a bit weird that like you'll just go up to another human being eventually and then be, oh, I love you. You love yeah. each other, hang out and we'll buy a house together. And that's like, what is that? Yeah, it's bonding. I mean, really, it boils down to something that's known as belongingness. People talk about oxytocin Ooh. a lot. Oxytocin, the love drug in the brain. And what it really is, is it's a, a part of the brain that it's a neuropeptide that creates belongingness, sort of a feeling of kinship and closeness to people. And the closer you are to people, mm. the closer you are to you feel your family or your close friends, the more of this oxytocin you'll have. Dogs have it and cats have it as well. It's been measured that if you go away and come back again, your dog will have a burst of oxytocin. Cat will have a little burst of oxytocin. They don't really Aww. care, to be honest, but they still have it. <laughs> They're sort of, oh, food. No, okay, and off they go. They have a little <laughs> bit. But there is this burst of oxytocin when someone's close to you. And when it's a huge one, that's what this thing we call love. It's this huge burst of oxytocin with familiarity, with good old-fashioned lust, the, the drive to have babies. And mm. you have this period at the beginning that's known as limerence, which is that hot, sweaty area at the beginning of a relationship when you can't think of anything else. Oh, you don't want to go on a year. Oh, and then at bit. the end of that becomes sort of attraction and other things. That's where you'll break up or you won't generally when that bit stops and it lowers a bit and you have either mm. got so used to each other, you can't imagine not being in each other's lives or you got so fed up with each other, you can't imagine being in each other's lives. One or the other will happen. <laughs> so the oxytocin drops right down. <laughs> no, very romantic when you talk no, about it. I know, that's the problem. <laughs> the thing is, yeah, you've got to be careful with looking at the science side because you're like, oh, is that all it is? Is it chemical? No, it's not. That hot and They're not going to put that on a Valentine's card, are they? No, but that early hot sweaty bit can be a lot of fun as well. So let's not forget that. You know. Oh, it can be amazing. Yeah. But like when you think about it, it's quite another primal human thing that mm. because when you experience rejection in that limerence yeah. bit. Oh my God, yeah. that like, it feels like the world's going to end. It's awful. People like, you know, murders happen because people yeah. feel rejected by somebody that they are attracted to. Because you have this massive, powerful bodily feeling of belonging. Your whole body is wanting that person to belong to you and you to belong to them. It's this urge. And when it ha doesn't happen, your oxytocin's up here, theirs is down there and everything else is going on. And you go, Oh, uh, I, I still want the person because my brain's still telling me I still want the person. And it, again, could lead to bad things. And you can have it for 
parts of the world like Jerusalem if you've got a very clever Pope who's got very pretty words, which is what happened with the Crusades, you know. We want that. Well, it doesn't want you, really. Oh. And so they needed to go and get that back, their love back. I read a paper about limerence, and it yeah. made a very compelling case that when you are in that point, and we've all done it, like mm-hmm. you've got the intense crush, you can't stop thinking about yeah. a person. When you get a text from them, you get the butterflies, and you get like, like you're boring all your friends by endlessly talking yeah. about them. And the paper said that there's such a riot of hormones mm. in your brain that in that period, you are actually addicted to that yes. person. You're addicted to them, yeah. and you need that. Hit. Yeah, it's not just oxytocin. You get your dopamine as well. Good old dopamine is our friend, and that it, it kicks in when you've enjoyed yourself. And lots of other things happen as well. There's a collection. Some people actually think love isn't a thing. It's a collection of things. There's a lust and attractiveness mm. and togetherness and lots of other little bits that come together to make this one thing. And you've got to have all of them for it to really kick off. But yeah, it's a big one when you're really in there. And if you can whip up a crowd, you're doing a similar thing. You can make them feel like they're part of this wonderful thing and they can go and vote for you or die Mm. for you or drink the Kool-Aid for you or any sorts of things, you know. So is that like disgust? Limerence can be transferred to other things? It can. You can make other people feel it, yes. You can make other people feel it if you're very good at doing that. Similarly, on the opposite side, disgust is also a great way of doing that. Disgust is actually, oxytocin is actually Mm. oppressed in the brain when you're disgusted by something. It's one of those things we've seen that it goes down. So you see something and the oxytocin goes down and other bits of the brain do other things, which we're not entirely sure about. And you go, yeah, no, I don't really don't want that. You reject it. And if you can say those over there, they're different to Mm. us. But we're brilliant. You're kind of using both. It's using using love and hate together as a tool. Again, is how it got a lot of historical wow. precedent. During the Cold Wars, America and Russia are at it. America spent loads of money trying to research how to make people love mm. America and hate Russia. Probably where modern psychology came from, the amount of money that was pumped into looking at that question in the 50s and 60s. Do we have any way of knowing if animals do this? They probably experience something. Whenever I'm asked, what are emotions? My answer is they're the way that some a living thing navigates the world when they don't have language. So if you can imagine, your cat and your dog doesn't speak English. Well, my cat might do a little bit, but that's a whole other story. But uh, they don't know English. They don't know language <laughs> never very tell much. You. Yeah. So they can't, if they're going into a room, they can't think, I need to go that way. And they can't think, I'm hungry now. And they can't think this is really nice. I'm going to go and sit on her knee and get my chin rubbed. They do that through feelings. They feel Mm. that they need to do that. They feel the need to do this. They feel like they should go there because then they'll have a good feeling, a pleasant feeling at the end of it. So the whole way Mm. that most animals navigate the world is through feelings. Subset of feelings is emotions, though that's its own thorny topic. What are emotions? What aren't emotions? Depends where you're from. Mm. Again, we humans have this extra bit, this bit of the brain here, that with language and all Brock's area and Vernick's area and all these things making it complicated. So we don't just have the feelings, we have the ability to think. We have this thing we like to think of as cognition. And some people think it's separate mm. to the emotions. Of course it isn't. They all work together. And almost every decision we make is an emotional one from where we sit on the bus to what our favourite food is to you name it. Why did you buy X car? Well, you didn't do it very often. Well, you might have gone, well, it's got better mileage or it's electric and I'm green. But why that electric car? Oh, it's a woman in your budget. Well, there's another 10 in your budget. Why that colour? I wanted to feel pretty in the car. Yes, yeah. My my favourite is recently somebody said to me, I don't think you can put cognition and emotion together. I think logic is the ultimate thing. I really love calculus. I said, you do what now with calculus? (laughs) (laughs) It took him a minute. (laughs) Oh, oh, yeah. There you go. There's an example of how emotion drives these things. But, But animals, therefore, will have feelings lots and lots of feelings Mm. and it comes down to labeling again should we label them with english words that are very particular to english or should we give them their own words what should we do but you know i know when my cat zazie is angry with me and when she isn't she makes that very plain so i'm Mm. going to call it anger and love love usually involves you're in the kitchen there's me food and anger usually evolves, you're not in the kitchen, where's me food? But it's right. still, you know, it's it's there. Yeah. And 
emotions seem to be incredibly important for our well they are just very important for our society but what's your thoughts on something like so i'm going to yeah. go big now like psychopathic personality disorder or <laughs> antisocial personality disorder ah. because they seem to be linked quite strongly to not being able to process emotions the way that other people can people with psychopathic personality disorder they generally to varying degrees are unable to process the emotions in others they can't see other people's feelings well they can't feel other people's feelings this is the idea okay. of mirror neurons that when somebody hurts your brain lights up and you feel what they feel they don't have that mm. they don't feel it at all they can work out what you're feeling but they can't necessarily feel it. They don't have that empathy. So they sort of lack right. all empathy for other things. That's not, although I am a big outspoken recently, loads of things, particularly in Spain, have come out where I've said, oh, psychopaths get a bad rap. Most of them are fine. You know, there's the, the <laughs> old one that does bad things, but the rest of them, the rest of them, there are a lot of psychopaths living happy, healthy lives as lawyers, bankers and politicians and surgeons they're the four main mm -hmm. things where you'll find a high number of psychopaths and personally if i'm on an operating table and something goes wrong i want my surgeon to be a psychopath who doesn't freak out and panic that he's okay. going to kill me just does his job calmly puts me back together mm -hmm. and i live so you know <laughs> they're not all bad there's this terrible thing just because you you have psychopathic personality disorder does not mean that you're going to murder people no. But it's interesting that like the fear around them is often because they can't feel, uh, allegedly can't feel emotions. Yeah. I mean, they themselves, I think, a lot of the time can feel emotions. They can get mm. angry in themselves. They just can't empathize with it in others. But what okay. they can do is learn to recognize it in others and think that means they're angry. What they're doing means they're angry. So I'm going to behave this way to diffuse the situation. Mm. So that's how a lot of them, that's why so many of them are really good barristers, because they can read people and adjust themselves accordingly to a jury, for example. One of the traits of a psychopath is being manipulative. And that's an example of that. They might not feel it, but they can see it and they can process it. And they can do it. I mean, it's obviously like, you know, yeah. psychopaths do have a bad reputation. But then I often think that like I'm held back by having colossal levels of empathy in my life, like to the point where I, I don't want to upset yeah. people and I'm a terrible people pleaser. And just if I could give away a little bit of that and just have like a little pinch of psychopathy, I think that I'd be an improvement. Well, yeah, I, I've often thought myself that if I was if I could just not be not feel things, I'd probably mm. be a billionaire by now. Do you reckon? I'd have probably started some kind of humoral medicine, brought it back and made the Gwyneth Paltrow <laughs> sorts really buy into it and pay me a fortune for a bloodletting. You know, something like that, I think, by now. But you can't do it because <laughs> of the guilt. That's not an idea like, anybody who hears no, that. No, you're aware that it's bullshit. It's hurting people, so you can't do it. Whereas yeah. if, you, if yeah, you could... exactly. Oh, honestly. Because <laughs> yeah. you know oh, the go you for have it. Been... I know the go for yes. it. You have been amazing to talk to about this. This is absolutely fascinating. Thank you. What do you think that as we go forward as a species, especially something like artificial intelligence, how is that going to play into our emotions, do you think? Well, there's a big question. A while ago, I gave a little bit of a talk to some philosophers and I said, if you want to make some money, get yourself mm. into whether AI has emotions or just acts like it has emotions and how we might like know the difference. Because there's a gravy train to ride on there. Books and lectures and everything. Because there are already, I forgot what it's called, but there's a robot dog that was sent to some journalists. And a few of the journalists refused to switch it off because it was so lifelike, it felt like they were killing it because wow. of the way it expressed itself. And I think... AI is going to do a similar thing, that it will start to respond to it. It already has. If you look at the way some people are reacting to chat, chat, GPT and Bing and the others, as if they are, oh, they've definitely got feelings. They wrote this message to me. You can see they've got feelings. And the guy in Google who had to quit, what he's doing is it's running an algorithm to pretend to have feelings at the moment. It's not feeling. There's a difference between those two things. Mm. So... What I've got to worry about is when they do feel things. And of course, that they don't feel things yet because emotions are more than just an algorithm and a response. They are all this mm. cultural stuff. Like I said at the beginning, they're all this cultural stuff and this learning about things. The best example of how an AI will get emotions is the film Blade Runner. Because the whole point mm. of that film is that some robots escape that have fake emotions 
uh, and they're not real and you can use a test to spot that they're fake. But give four years and because they'll be immersed in culture and immersed in the world, they will develop real emotions because they'll have all this input from the outside world that will make them actually start to feel things. And I think that's how AI would do it. You'd have to immerse them in the world and get them. So let's not. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but at the moment, no, it's not, not going anywhere because the science that. is... Yeah, I don't think it's going to be a while because they're still using 40-year-old science, to be honest, that says there are six emotions and all humans have only these six emotions. So all we've got to do is code for these six emotions. That's six, I'm doing five. Because I'm thinking of Inside Out by Disney that you only use five of the six. How many emotions do we have? Depends which language you're speaking. Loads. Very true. Infinite. <laughs> uh, a guy called Paul Ekman uh, did an experiment in 71. It, there were six basic emotions, but he went into the middle of the jungle, found the foray tribe and gave, ran some tests on them and found that they had the same six. And so said it's universal. The test wasn't great. The foray tribe weren't distant to Westerners. They wore jeans. They had money. There's lots of things. So they had seen Western culture. So And the translations were a bit leading and there's all sorts of it but oh. this is kind of stuck that it's that i can never remember the six let's see if i can do it this time happiness sadness fear surprise disgust and anger they're the six i noticed only one of them's positive one of them's a happy emotion which itself was a big red flag for oh, me yes. it's like where's love where's hate it's because oh, yes. these six can be expressed on the face and that's what he was looking for he's looking for them looking at pictures of faces and saying that face is a happy face that face is an angry face that face is and they're all exaggerated faces which is another problem with the experiment and they only had the six uh, to choose from so there's another and so on it's been since shown to be not such an experiment, but they still, the AI people, for the most part, not all of them, are still using that science to code the AI with emotions. Something called effective computing. And they're still trying to use those six quite a lot. And it doesn't work because we've got more than six. Depending on your language, you've got as many as your language has. Wow. Wow. And this is why scientists and humanities people should work yes. together. Yes, exactly. Is I, I get it though. I've talked to computer programmers and said, you've got a choice. You've told to give a computer emotions. You can either go for, for column A, which is you've got to code six things and make it recognize those six things. Or you can go for column B, where mm. there are hundreds and possibly thousands in English. And then you've got to go through every other language in the world and look at their hundreds and thousands. So one is going to take you the weekend and the one your children will be doing long after you die. Which do you go for? I get it. I'd go for yeah, one. Yeah, it's a bit easier, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but there are some people starting to do more complicated stuff, so. You have been amazing to talk to. Thank you so, so much. This, honestly, <laughs> I could talk to you all day about this. But if people want to know more about you and your research, where can they find you? I have a book out. It's called A Human History of Emotion. Uh, available at, at most good bookstores, certainly on Amazon. Uh, you can read there because that's where I try to write it without all the uh, jargon that you get in the more, shall we say, academic books on the subject. So I'm trying to do it there. Uh, there's that. I do talks where I'll talk about the emotions of environmentalism and the future of our planet and how it affects our emotions. I'm just rounding about. I've got YouTube channels. I'm at Dr. Rich FG on just about everything Instagram, f Twitter, you name it. Oh. Thank you so much for joining me, Richard. You've been an absolute treat. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening. And thank you so much to Richard for joining me. And if you like what you heard, although perhaps liking is an emotion which we now know doesn't actually exist, but whatever it was that you felt in that constructed space of voidal emptiness... <laughs> But perhaps you could find the time to like, review and subscribe to us wherever it is that you get your podcasts. Join me again, Betwixt the Sheets, the history of sex scandal in society, a podcast by History Hit. This podcast includes music by Epidemic Sounds.